Chapter 10, Trapped Everyone was up at dawn when the first songs of chickadees and warblers rang through the trees. The morning was gray and damp. Mama began preparing flatbread outside as if every move took enormous effort. Yellow Wing sat smoking his pipe in a patch of weak light angling through the pines, his shoulders hunched. When Mama offered him some flatbread, he shook his head, then got up and walked away. He is ashamed of Papa, Suzette thought. She was eager to leave the wigwam behind. Mama, I told Gabrielle we could go paddling today, she said, careful not to meet her mother's eye. Paddling, granddaughter, grandmother asked, at such a time as this? I need something to do, Suzette said quickly. I can't just sit here and, and think. I promised Gabrielle. May I go? Suzette turned to Mama and saw that her eyes were shining with tears. Suzette had never seen her mother cry, and the very idea frightened her. Mama was the pine pitch that held her family together. Maybe I should stay, she thought guiltily. Maybe I shouldn't leave Mama. But Mama decided for her. You may go, she said quietly. We need new bulrushes. It's early, but you may be able to find some in the bog at Big Bay. Suzette hadn't expected a chore, but she didn't argue. She went back into the lodge and grabbed some dried fish and cranberries to fill the hole in her belly, and a knife to cut the bulrushes. Then she rummaged among her belongings until she found her pouch. It was made from a beaver pelt and decorated with fringe. The pebble grandfather had given her was inside. So was the silver crucifix Papa had given her when she was small, and a little beaded turtle her mother had sewn. They were Suzette's most cherished possessions, and she wanted them with her as she searched for Dupree's camp. Back outside, she tied the knife and her pouch around her waist. Ajawak, what are you doing? Grandmother was busy unraveling a new wool blanket from the trading post. Suzette knew she would dye the wool and weave it into something else, a sass, perhaps, or a gathering bag. Grandmother rarely accepted a French trade item without changing it in some way to suit her. She was wearing an ear bob made of a silver thimble Papa had given her to sew with. Suzette felt a wave of irritation. Why couldn't Grandmother just accept things and people as they were? Why did the French bother her so? Suzette struggled to hide her annoyance as she answered, Getting ready to go, Grandmother. I want to take my pouch with me. Wait. It was a command. Suzette sighed as Grandmother put her blanket aside and disappeared into her own wigwam. Suzette was fidgeting by the time Grandmother emerged. You'd be wise not to be in such a hurry, Grandmother said. She reached for her granddaughter's hand, placed something on Suzette's palm, and closed her fingers around it. Carry this in your bag. It will bring you a happy outcome to your difficulties. Suzette looked at the shriveled twig in her hand. Grandmother's gift was a piece of dried root from a wild pea plant, the traditional Ojibwe charm for bringing success to someone anxious about a task. The charm seemed as old as Grandmother. Then she noticed Grandmother's waiting eyes. Suzette felt ashamed. No wonder Grandmother worried about French influences. No Ojibwe girl was raised to be impatient or disrespectful to her elders. Thank you, Grandmother, she said quietly slipping the root into her pouch. I will carry it with me. Suzette took her canoe to the beach. Mist was drifting over the lake, and the water looked dark and cool. She put the canoe down carefully, just as someone appeared from a side path along the shore, carrying a spear and a basket holding several flopping trout. It was Niskigwan's son, two fish. Suzette hadn't seen him face to face since they'd left the mainland. His taunt rang in her ears. Blue eyes, blue eyes. The reminder made her feel sick and she froze. Should she speak to him? Turn away? Before she could decide, he stopped in front of her and opened his mouth to speak. She couldn't bear to hear another insult and she cut him off. Dakota boy, she hissed. You are an ugly boy. Your mother was one of our enemies. Two fish pulled his lips together, covering his broken tooth. Then he turned and walked away. Suzette stared after him, feeling cold and small. When Gabrielle joined her, the girls settled their paddles into the canoe. They were about to carry it into the water when someone called, Suzette! Baptiste and Monsieur Roussain were walking along the shore. Suzette, bonjour, the clerk said cheerfully. Bonjour, Monsieur, Monsieur Roussain, 
Baptiste, Suzette voiced herself to look both men in the eye. It wasn't their fault Papa was locked up. What are you doing here so early? I spend all my days inside the store, Roussein said. I often walk here early in the morning. Where are you girls headed? I'm trying to catch the real thief, Suzette wanted them to know, that she didn't believe her Papa was guilty. But she wished she had kept silent as Baptiste squatted to look her in the eye. Suzette, I don't think that's a good idea, he said gently. I told you before, you should give that up. The thief is probably a rough man. Doesn't your mother have enough problems without you getting into trouble? The concern in his voice gave Suzette pause. She had never seen Baptiste worry about anyone. Baptiste was older than she, and wise. She knew she should listen to him. But what choice did she have? We're just looking, she said slowly. We won't get into any trouble. He still looked worried. Come to me if you find anything. I'll help you. Roussein was worried, too. Should you two girls be heading out alone? The lake waters can be dangerous, and it smells like rain. Suzette shrugged. We're not afraid of rain. Her tutor shook his head. Suzette, no good French girl would run wild as you do. Remember your French blood. How could she forget it? We'll be fine, she called as the girl splashed into the lake with the canoe and stepped inside. We'll keep close to shore. Don't worry. Suzette sat in the bow and used her paddle to help point the canoe east. Mama asked me to cut bulrushes at Big Bay, she said over her shoulder to Gabrielle, and that takes us in the direction we saw in the Skigwan and Big Nicholas coming from. She had looked in their canoe last evening as the men paddled in. It had been empty, no fish or fishing gear, and that made her even more suspicious. Why had they been out paddling together? Suzette dipped her paddle with long, even strokes. The water was so clear she could see the, rock, she could see the rocky lake bottom, an occasional fish. As the girls paddled past the point, leaving the fort and the Ojibwe camp behind, Suzette was surprised to see Yellowwing wading waist-deep waist into the cold lake. As she and Gabrielle eased the canoe toward him, he waved. Where are you girls going? Out to cut bulrushes, Suzette said quietly. Mama asked me to. What are you doing? Yellowwing lifted a fish trap from the water. It was the one he had been repairing, designed so fish could swim in a narrow opening at one end, without being able to turn around and swim back out. I set this last night, he said, and carefully opened a gate on the top of his trap. With a nod of satisfaction, he lifted a large speckled lake trout through the gate. It twisted in his hands. Thank you for feeding my family, Yellowwing murmured to the trout, then turned to the girls. This fish swam in the opening and tried all night to get back out the same way. He never thought to try to leave through the top. You're a good fisherman, Yellowwing, Suzette told him. His success meant a meal of fresh trout will be waiting for her return. If they let me see Philippe later, I'll tell him, Yellowwing said bitterly. I'll tell him that at least he doesn't need to fear that his wife and daughters will go hungry. Then he added more gently, Don't worry about that, Suzette. Suzette repeated his comforting words in her head as they moved on. Yellowwing was a good provider. When the sturgeon spawned each spring, he speared more fish than almost anyone and the family's best winter feast had come after he killed a moose. She stopped paddling abruptly and turned around. Gabrielle, I know why Papa told Captain Damboise he was the thief. Gabrielle looked startled. Why? Because they were questioning Yellowwing. Yellowwing was with Papa the night the furs were stolen. Captain Damboise might have locked them both up. Since the soldiers found Papa's crucifix, and there was no chance they believed he was innocent, Papa wanted to be sure Yellowwing went free so there would be someone left to look after the rest of us. That had to be it. Suzette felt a flood of relief so strong she wanted to whoop or cry or laugh out loud. Everything else could be blamed on whoever had truly stolen the furs. The one thing she hadn't understood, the part it had hurt the most, was hearing that Papa had confessed. Now she knew why he had done it. He had done it to protect his family. Suzette lifted her paddle and began to stroke with fresh energy. Come on, Gabrielle, she called. I want to find that cave. All that morning, the girls paddled along the eastern side of the island, eyeing the rocky shore as they made their way toward Big Bay. Each time they spied a shadowy nook among the rocks, they paused to get a good look. Several times they beached the canoe and scrambled up to see if some slight overhang might be a cave entrance, but they found nothing. 
they stopped to look at every rock where gulls gathered, with no better results. This is getting us nowhere, Suzette admitted finally, when half the day was gone. They'd passed Big Bay and the spot where Suzette had found Dupree's camp, without finding anything. Gabrielle scooped some lake water to her mouth for a drink. Suzette, the clouds are getting lower and grayer. We should head back before the rain comes in. Suzette opened her mouth to protest, then closed it. I'll come back out with you after the bad weather, Gabrielle added. I promise. Suzette swallowed her disappointment, heartened by her friend's loyalty. All right, she said. Let's go back to the bog at Big Bay. I can't go home without cutting some bulrushes. It won't take long. Soon the girls had a good armload of bulrushes lying in the canoe, ready for Mama to clean and dye and weave with basswood fibers into sturdy sitting mats. Suzette paused to munch some dried cranberries and let her gaze drift across the water to the tiny fin-shaped island that she had noticed the day she found Dupree's camp. It was about half as far away as the mainland. Suddenly she stopped chewing. Gabrielle, look, maybe that's Gull Rock. She pointed to a rock outcrop on the little island that looked just like the head of a gull. Gabrielle considered. It could be. It would be an easy paddle from Dupree's camp. Let's go take a look, Suzette reached for her paddle. Gabrielle didn't move. We can't paddle over there. Papa has told me never to cross open water on the Great Lake without an adult along. Suzette hesitated. Hadn't she heard the same command? She'd never been away from the shore without Papa or Mama or Yellow Wing. She chewed her lip, staring across to the little island. I'm sure we can do it. But a storm may be coming, Gabrielle argued. Let's ask my Papa or one of the fort men to paddle us over. We're strong, Suzette said stubbornly. She didn't want to ask for help. What if no one believed her? What if some of the men did investigate and found nothing? Maybe they would be angry and think she was lying to help her papa. We can do it! Dupree's camp is just north of here. What if he sees us paddling to the island? I don't think it's likely. Please, Gabrielle? Gabrielle stared at the rock shaped like a gull head. All right, she said finally. Just a quick look, though, Suzette. One quick look, then we head for home. Yes, one quick look. Suzette was already drawing her paddle straight through the water toward the bow, turning the canoe away from La Pointe Island. Once away from shore, the girls were paddling into stronger wind. Suzette felt a flicker of apprehension down her backbone. What would happen if Dupree did spot them heading toward Gull Rock? She couldn't help looking back over her shoulder. The crossing took longer than she had expected. When they finally reached waist-deep water again, Suzette slipped over the side into the cool water to walk the birch bark canoe into the shallows. She looked around carefully as she towed the canoe toward a narrow beach. She didn't want to stumble over Dupree and Mikhail, but no other canoes were in sight. Boulders and down trees, evidence of a lake storm fury, littered the beach and steep rocky slope beyond. Cliffs towered over her head on either side of the beach, jutting straight into the water. A few scrubby pines clung stubbornly to the rocks, their roots anchored in crevices and their gnarled branches leaning over the water. High above Suzette's head, a tangled thicket of stunted juniper covered the island's crest. On such a small island, beaten by the wind on all sides, no tree grew full and tall. From the beach, Suzette spied a dark opening near a boulder on the slope above. That might be the cave, she breathed, pointing. Gabrielle held the canoe near shore as Suzette scrambled up to look. She had to climb over several downed trees near the opening. Gusts of cold wing pierced her damp leggings, reminding her that Gabrielle was probably shivering and impatient below. She cocked her head, listening to make sure Dupree was not inside, but she heard nothing except a gull crying in the distance. Stooped, she peered into the opening. She could barely make out the walls of a shadow-filled cavern. It is a cave, she whispered. Surely this was Dupree's hiding place. She climbed back down to the shore. I found the cave, but I think we should hide our canoe before we go inside. Why? You said we'd just take a peek and head back. Gabrielle cast a nervous look toward La Pointe. Suzette shook her head. We shouldn't take chances. I wouldn't want Dupree to spot it. The girl struggled to carry the fragile canoe over the rocks to the far side of the island, where it couldn't be seen by anyone approaching from La Pointe. As soon as it was safely hidden beneath some pines, they scrambled back over the rough terrain and made their way to the cave. Suzette's skin prickled as she led the way through the low entrance. What would she find? Please, please, let it be something that will help Papa. Once inside, she was able to stand, 
but it was hard to see anything in the dim light leaking through the low opening. The air smelled dank and musty, and the ceiling, low enough to touch with her hand, seemed to press down on her. Suzette wasn't used to being confined, and she shivered. Did Papa feel this way, locked away at the fort? Thinking of Papa stiffened her determination. She blinked as her eyes adjusted to the gloom. Slowly she made out barrels and untidy bales of furs piled against the rock wall. Whole bales! Dupree must have been doing a lot of illegal trading. The cave was small, maybe the size of three wigwams, and the jumble stretched from wall to wall. We found the hiding place, Suzette whispered. It's Dupree's cache. I know it. It must be. We must go back and tell Captain Damboise. Wait, Gabrielle. I want to see if there's anything here that will help Papa. Like what? Come on, Suzette, let's go. Just a minute more. Suzette ran her hands over the nearest bundles and barrels, wishing she had better light. If only she'd brought a torch. There must be something here to tell us who the thief is, she thought, drumming her fingers on one of the parcels. She felt a few tiny trade beads under her fingertips and played with them absently while she tried to think. But nothing helpful came to mind. You're right, she said finally. What did I expect to find? A neat ledger like Monsieur Roussain keeps, listing who bought the stolen furs? We should just leave. Suddenly the sound of a man's voice echoed from the beach below. Suzette's blood turned cold as the Great Lake itself. Gabrielle clutched her arm. Let's run. No, they'd see us, Suzette hissed. Hide. She grabbed Gabrielle's hand and darted to the back of the cave. The girls crouched behind two barrels and a fur bale. Suzette tried to squeeze herself into the ground, hoping desperately that in the shadows they'd be invisible from the cave entrance. They must have seen us paddling over, Gabrielle whispered. Suzette didn't want to face that possibility. Maybe they're just bringing in another load, she whispered back. We'll wait until they're gone again, then leave. It sounded good, but the cave was small. If the men were here to load these goods into their canoe, or if they lit torches, Suzette's skin felt damp and clammy. Fear twisted in her belly. She closed her eyes and waited. Gabrielle clutched one of her hands so hard it hurt. Suzette slid her free hand onto her pouch. Her fingers found the pebble, the turtle, the cross, the pea root. She gathered them all into her palm and squeezed, desperate for reassurance. Footsteps sounded on the rocks outside, accompanied by voices raised in anger. Suzette's heart pounded as she recognized Dupree's voice. Imbecile, he snapped. You left this morning without hiding the entrance. It's not my fault. That was Mikhail's accented French. You told me to hurry back. Why must you yell at me? Because you deserve it. Suzette could tell that Dupree had entered the cave, for his voice rang loud and harsh in the enclosed space. She held her breath, every muscle clenched tight. Go away, go away. The silence that followed seemed to last forever. That's strange, Dupree finally muttered. It doesn't look like anyone's been here. But I thought sure I saw a canoe near the shore below. All you saw was a shadow. We paddled over here for nothing, Mikhail complained. His voice was muscled, muffled, as if he was waiting outside. For nothing? I found out you forgot to hide the entrance, didn't I? What if one of the fortmen had spotted this place? What if we came back tomorrow to load the canoes and begin to paddle back to Montreal and found that the soldiers had taken all of our furs? Dupree's voice faded, too. Suzette drew a tiny breath of relief as she imagined him stooping and leaving the cave. She heard Mikhail's muffled voice, then Dupree's harsh one. Oh, shut up, and help me with this. Suzette heard something being dragged, a branch snapping, Mikhail muttering an oath. The men were hauling the downed trees across the small entrance to the cave. Horror washed away the trickle of relief she'd felt. They were barricading the cave. Finally, the noise and commotion ceased. The men's voices faded away. Suzette, Gabrielle whispered, are they gone? I think so, but let's wait. Give them plenty of time. Still holding hands, they waited. The sound of their breathing echoed in the, in the deepening gloom. Now, Suzette whispered finally, they must be away from the island by now. The girls stumbled to their feet and made their way toward the entrance. Only a few faint shafts of light angled through the branches of the downed trees blocking the opening. Maybe we can push them back, Suzette said. On their knees, the two girls tried to shove the nearest tree away. The pine trunk was whirled with branches, broken now, that stabbed at their arms and faces. Suzette finally managed to find a clear spot on the trunk for her shoulder. Pushing her heels into the dirt, she shoved with all her might. Help me, Gabrielle! I'm trying! Gabrielle was on her belly now, straining against the barricade. Nothing moved. It's no good. 
They must have braced the trees between rocks, Suzette said finally, sinking back on her haunches. She was breathless. Her face stung where a branch had whipped it, and one finger was bleeding. She stared at the barricade, facing the hard truth for the first time. They were trapped. <laughs>